Hello again and welcome to Weymouth Independent Evangelical Church for this sermon for Sunday the 22nd of November. Well today we will consider an event in the life of one of the early characters in the Bible, a man called Joseph. He was a great grandson of Abraham, one of the twelve sons of Jacob. In his early life he was a spoilt lad who was hated by his brothers and for this he was kidnapped, kidnapped by them and sold as a slave into Egypt. His life there had its ups and downs. At first he got on well with his master, a man called Potiphar. And when he resisted attempts by Potiphar's wife, though, to seduce him, um, she lied about his behaviour and he was thrown into prison. Even then, Joseph remained faithful to God and was given the gift to interpret some dreams and those of two other prisoners, Pharaoh's baker and butler, came true. The baker was executed and the butler restored to his position. Joseph hoped that the butler would put in a good word for him to Pharaoh and perhaps get him released. And so time passed and we'll now read what happened from Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, and we'll start by reading the first eight verses. So Joseph was in prison. Then it came to pass, at the end of two full years, that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then, behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men and Pharaoh told them his dreams but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Well I'm going to start with a lesson. A lesson it's from the beginning of this chapter so I'll put it here right at the beginning of the sermon. In the first verse that we read, we have those words, after two full years. Two years had passed since that butler had got his freedom and he had not delivered on a promise that he had made to Joseph. How would you or I have been feeling? Those two years must have passed slowly for Joseph. I'm sure that uh, he, he didn't uh, have much of a comfortable time in prison in those days. Not much entertainment, no letters from home to help pass the time. I'm sure Joseph was only human and I would expect him to have felt loneliness, depression, 
despondency. Many people in that situation would perhaps go on to become bitter, resentful, cynical, and I might say, without, I trust, sounding too irreverent, one could imagine him thinking along the lines of, God, it was sticking to your rules that got me in here, and I gave you the credit for interpreting those dreams. Why won't you get me out? But Joseph seems not to have fallen in this way. I wonder why not. Was he a man of iron character, fierce determination, unshakable resolve? Well, he was becoming so. But his character by nature seems to have been more of a mummy and daddy's boy who felt favoured and a bit above himself. But God was moulding him. God was with him. God was with him in Potiphar's house. He was with him in those early days in prison. So why should God desert him now? Of course, he would not. The lesson for us in these words is to trust God, to believe his promises, to wait patiently for the fulfilment of his will. He knows the end from the beginning. We don't. He will bring about his purposes and all things will work together for good to those he has called into his family. Well, we might wonder why the Lord orchestrated events so that Joseph had to endure these two years in prison. Nothing, as far as is recorded for us, seems to have happened in those years. We don't know that. We could say, well, if Joseph had been released before Pharaoh's dreams, though, he might have just gone back to Canaan and been lost to the rest of the plot. But then it could also be argued that God only needed to send Pharaoh his dreams a couple of years earlier. The fact is, we do not know the ways of God. We cannot compare them to the ways of men. The word faith and trust spring to mind. And that is his gift to us, to enable us to say with Abraham, Shall not the Lord of all the earth do right? And also we could say with Job, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Well, let's hear the next few verses from Genesis chapter 41, verses 9 to 14. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he had interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged the baker. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh here is a, an interesting character. This Pharaoh and uh, subsequent bearers of the name being used by God 
even though there is no record of any of them actually believing God as anything more than just another divinity of the day. Yet God used these men in his plan. And we can learn, even from Pharaoh, something of the way of salvation. Have we not been at times in the past, uh, perhaps we still are, like Pharaoh, trying every possible way to be masters of our own lives? And we turn to other men and we seek their advice. But finally, admitting that only one could meet our needs and save us from the wrath of God. And that one was the Lord Jesus Christ. So Pharaoh here searched his own mind for the interpretation of his dreams. He asked people that he thought were important and knowledgeable. But in the end, he was willing to ask this favour of a foreign slave in prison, in prison for supposedly committing a despicable offence against his master. Human logic and pride rejects appealing to a supposedly discredited criminal dying upon a Roman cross to be the only one who could meet our need for salvation. But Jesus is that one, and he can. If anyone hearing this has not begged this Jesus, the Son of God, to remember him or her in paradise, do it now. But there is another lesson in these verses, in verses 9 to 13, in the words of the butler. Whatever his human motives, he did the right thing. We could say that he witnessed. Based on his own personal experience, and without, at least overtly, claiming any credit for himself, he pointed Pharaoh to the one who could rescue him. Imagine, imagine suggesting to one as powerful as Pharaoh, one who, with hardly a thought and for no recorded reason, had executed his chief baker, and then to put his trust in Joseph the prisoner. Surely we, who know from personal experience the revelation in the word of God of the way to eternal life, surely we must not withhold that information from those around us, from our families, our friends, even our neighbour, and that includes all that we come into contact with. <coughs> But now let's think about Joseph. He was brought out of the prison, spruced up, and no doubt told something on the lines of, Pharaoh wants to see you. He's impressed with your ability to interpret dreams. And all his wise men have given up on this one. Well, Joseph knew that in the past he had been the, the channel for the interpretation of dreams. Perhaps he knew that his predictions for the butler and the baker had come true. So what would he say when Pharaoh asked him for help? Would he boast of his ability, his past achievements? No. Just as when he was asked the same question about interpreting dreams. Can you interpret my dreams for me? Back in prison, he gave the same answer. God can and perhaps will interpret your dreams. Evidently, Joseph had a gift 
for interpreting dreams. But he knew that it was a gift that had to be used as the Lord intended. Just as an aside, I think it's fair to say that though the Lord used dreams throughout the times recorded in the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments, <coughs> there is little evidence to say that he uses them in the same way now. I'm sure that he could. But we have the revelation of his will for us in the completed scriptures. And by prayerful study of these, both alone and together with other believers, he guides his people now. But one thing that I want to draw our minds to concerning Joseph and his gift is to do with the gifts that we are given. Yes, the Lord does give gifts to all his children. As I have said, some revelatory gifts are no longer needed. But many of the gifts that we read of in Ephesians 4 verse 11 and 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 are gifts for the duration of the church upon earth. Gifts that include the pastors, teachers, evangelists, administrators and all those who help in other ways. Just as Joseph acknowledged God as the source of his gift to interpret dreams and made no boast of for himself, so it is that we may see each of the gifts present in ourselves as no cause for pride or boasting, for every good gift is from above. So back to Joseph. He listened to the dreams. Let's hear an outline now from Genesis chapter 41, verses 17 to 21. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. When they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. Joseph passed on truthfully the interpretation given to him by God. Let's read it in verse 26 of that same chapter. So verse 26, Joseph said to Pharaoh, The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years. The seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come to all the land of Egypt. But after them... Seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will be not, not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. This prophecy... This declaration of the Lord's intent was not what we should call 
a fatalistic forecast of disaster. No, in seven years a massive famine will come and cause much destruction. It was a statement of fact, but it was a call to action, a warning given that suffering may be averted. We must remember in our witness and our ministry that we have a message that one day the Lord will return and this world as we know it will end. Judgment will fall upon all. Yes, this is indeed a statement of future fact, though in its case we are not given a time or a date to declare, but it is also a shout of warning, for there is action that can be taken. Not that we can delay or prevent God's intention, but like the preparations that could be made for the forthcoming famine in Egypt, that people on the earth may repent. Repent of their sin and put their faith in the Lord Jesus. And then, at the end of time, the consequences will be then, for them, will then be a total sparing from the eternal punishment that is decreed for unbelievers. Now the account that we have here in Genesis 41 is specific to that time and place. But like all the scriptures, it is recorded for our learning. Superficially, and we might say practically, yes, it does teach good sense. The laying aside a portion of our goods to be useful to ourselves and beneficial to others if difficult times come. I believe that it is right to accept such instruction from the Lord as part of his benevolence to his creation, and not to insist that all scripture must be interpreted spiritually all of the time. But, as I've suggested already, we must give priority to preparation for eternity. And for that, we look to what he has provided through the saving sacrifice of his son to pay the ransom for his people. Well, there are a number of lessons in this chapter that we could expand upon, but I must hasten on. In those days, seven years of good harvest must have seemed a real blessing. And to start with, I expect everyone involved who was instructed and guided to build storehouses and fill them, <coughs> they would have worked with enthusiasm. But what about after three, four, five, six, seven years of plenty? By then, many would have forgotten about those dreams. Oh, everything's going fine. Could there really be a change after these seven years of stable conditions? I wonder if complacency might have begun to be a problem. Oh, look, we've got a good lot stored. Let's just relax and enjoy ourselves now. We we deserve a rest after all that sowing and harvesting. Yes, both practically and spiritually, we can become complacent and lazy. But do not be deceived. Just as the famine, when it did bite in that ancient world, was severe, Severe to the extent that all the good years were forgotten. So it will be on the day of judgment. Or the day of our passing from this earth to face the Lord as judge. 
watch, for you do not know the day or the hour when the Lord will come. Well now I must come to a concluding thought. Again it is a sort of two-pronged lesson. It's a lesson for those who seek to assure their future. <coughs> and then also a lesson for those who are already certain and assured of where they will spend eternity. For those who seek, we can deduce from Pharaoh's words in verse 55 an answer. Whatever Joseph tells you to do, do it. In other words, put your trust in this one sent to us by God. I was reminded of the words on another occasion, almost identical words. <coughs> words said by Mary, the mother of Jesus, in John chapter 2, verse 5. Speaking of Jesus, she said, when those at a wedding feast were lost and confused, whatever he says, do it. So our lesson Hear the words of Christ and do them. Follow his command to take him at his word and trust him fully. To repent and believe that he came to save sinners by taking their place under the judgment of God. And the lesson for all of us who have done that Perhaps we should re remember Pharaoh's butler and Mary and give them their dues. Neither of them could save their people, but they both pointed unambiguously to the one who could. Do we do that as often as we should, or as clearly? or as forcefully, perhaps, as we should. The evidence of the scriptures proved that obeying the Lord's command did produce results. Let's make sure that we become neither complacent nor despondent and make our witness bold, clear and perhaps loud. For we do not know the day nor the hour when he will return. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for these words in, your, in the scriptures. These records of events so long ago that are relevant and applicable for us today. Help us. To trust the Lord Jesus Christ and help us who have trusted him to declare him as the way of salvation for all who are sinners and that is indeed every one of us. So help us Lord this day to acknowledge and recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour and we come in his name now. Amen.